For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Seven oh six. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with FL Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Good evening, Josh. Hello, Dan. And this evening on the program, we're going to chat with Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting. Of course, uh, they've been on. Uh, they've been at that uh, very uh, landmark to carry location for a very long time. Business in operation since uh, the nineteen fourteen. This is wow. a third generation business. Incredible. So uh, Bram and Darren on the way. Nick Moretis as well talks about uh, taxes. More specifically, uh, the recent provincial and federal budgets and the impact it's going to have on your business. So that's coming up in the program. Uh, but first, a bit of entrepreneurial news of the weekend. This is a pretty cool story, Josh. A um, couple of students from Harvard uh, emailed out pitches and uh, and somehow managed to get the attention of uh, of big banks in in Asia. Tell me about that story. This is this is a group actually. They they believe that small SME, small medium-sized enterprises, were having trouble connecting with whether it's venture capitalists, private equity, whatever money that were coming their way. So they actually are developing an app to connect these two entities, these two separate groups. But of course, it's an app. It's still in its infancy stages. And naturally, they need some money to back it. They went out and said, you know what? The, the North America can be saturated. There's all this stuff out there. Let's go outside North America. They, they both have backgrounds in, in Southeast Asia, and, and they, they stayed away from the, the China and the Hong Kong. That's, that's, that's kind of done a lot. So they went in different parts of Southeast Asia. They approached a, a bank or a financial institution, kind of sent an email to the, the CEO and said, this is our plan, and, and we're trying to put it together. And a few hours later, they got a, I'm interested. Uh, and really, the, the the moral of this story, because it's not for everybody that can just go and, and hit one of these big South uh, Southeast Asian banks, uh, but certainly the the opportunity or the desire for these institutions around the world to get into the game because they have money to spare, they have money to spend. They want to get into the technolo- technological game. They want to get into these these dot coms, so to speak, and. Want, but they don't necessarily have the legs to get out there and pitch it. So, you know, you, some people that understand the market and take a chance, go for it. There is capacity out there. Maybe not in North America. It's probably a much harder pitch because of so much activity and so so many so much competition in that in that field. But beyond that and outside the borders, take your shot. I remember a story we spoke about a few weeks ago, Dan, where a company pitched to a, a, a private equity firm in uh, in Shenzhen, which is just just over uh, the border, Hong Kong near mainland in mainland China, and they were like, yeah, there were there was this competition that they won because China, the east, the far east nation world, is trying to get into this market in a bigger way. I mean, there's no question they're already in a big way, but even more so. Hmm. So, what about email p- pitching in general, regardless of what you're you're selling? Is that something that's becoming more and more common? Is that is it better even than picking up the phone? Well. I, I don't think it's necessarily better, but you might have no alternative. I mean, if you're pitching to somebody that's uh, halfway around the world, that's 12 hours away from you, uh, while it's certain, and you don't know them, so how are you going to get in front of them? Well, email is certainly one way to do it. Is it the best way? I don't know. It's a shot in the dark because how many people discard a whole bunch of emails? How many emails end up in junk? You, you just never know. But it also doesn't take much effort to send out an email. I guess the other side of the store, the coin is if you send it out, depending on where you're sending it to, are you protecting your own IP, your intellectual property? Are you giving anything away? Are you, are you kind of divulging some, some information? So you have to kind of be careful what you're emailing out there as well. Uh, also in the news, uh, entrepreneurial-wise this week, uh, Bill Marno, a federal finance minister, calling on businesses to spend more on R&D, research and development to keep Canada in general as a nation competitive. Is the implication here that uh, that we're not investing enough in R&D in the private sector? I, th- I think the it might be. Uh, I don't know. There's, uh, there's a lot that Bill Morneau, I think, has, has said over the last uh, number of months as he's been in office. Uh, you know, he, he keeps saying he's, he's not a politician, but he seems to have taken to the role really well when he, when he speaks to the public and kind of says generalities, but maybe not much more. Uh, I, I think that the small, medium businesses are investing in some R&D, but they are recognizing that there's not so much that they're getting back from a government aspect. They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it so they stand out with their competition and in their markets. 
what they're getting back. I mean, the, the, the tax credit program that's out there has been cut drastically. Granted, there are a bunch of small businesses and entrepreneurs that maybe took took a little bit too much advantage of it and got slapped on the wrist, and and that's probably one reason why why governments cut back a little bit. But they have cut back, so it's it's that much harder to get the tax credits that are that are much easier. Uh, even though you have to and you spend before you make it, but it's much easier to collect than going after various grants and and institutions that that might support. So I think it's it's great that that Canada is pushing R and D and trying to bring back uh, what maybe has been lost a little bit in Canada. I just don't know if it's if it's the right path to take for them. We've been talking about uh, in the last few weeks, you know, certain hot sectors, uh, drones being one of them, drone production. Uh, here's one: uh, venture capitalists showing more interest in ag tech, so agriculture technology. Farming in Canada is has been there forever. I mean, for, first of all, North America, no question. But the technology that can be applied to farming today is absolutely astounding. The data we all, I think, most people know that. Uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into farming. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of potential improvement. There's a lot of old technology that's that's there and people's gut and, you know, the, the old farmer that wakes up at 4.30 in the morning and knows that's the time to go and, and, and pluck his chickens or collect the eggs or what have you. But what hasn't been done to the nth degree, I believe, and at least in the, you know, certainly maybe in the last few years, but not beyond that, is the data collection. Do you know how much fertilizer to spread and what gives the most return for, for your crop? Do you know exactly how much water? What is the temperature that the crop, the, that the crop will go the, the grow the best? And the machines that are out there today are collecting all this data so that the farmers can go and say, you know what, I won't use you know, 10,000 liters of water this season. I can use 9,212 because that's exactly how much I know I need. The fertilizer, when it's a little too cold outside, well, maybe when it drops a few degrees, I'll know to put it out because the crop will be that much better. The technology that's being applied today to whatever machinery or whatever data collection I think is absolutely outstanding and is probably in its infancy. So there's, I think there's a lot of room to grow in this area. From Financial Post, another uh, story is- or issue we've been talking about a lot, and that is um, uh, online retailers versus brick and mortar. And the trend now is actually a bit of both, really splitting your efforts 50-50 in what's uh, being called uh, clicks and bricks uh, as a model. That's, uh, that, that's I guess, the, the new term today, the clicks and the bricks, the bricks and mortar versus the online. And and we, we've spoken about this a number of times, and, and we've had various guests on the show and invariably, they say it's great. People are selling online. It's important to be out there. The social media, the number of transactions and the volume it's online is great. But if you're building a brand, somebody wants and needs to go feel and touch and see it exists. And in this particular example, where they, where this, uh, they believe it's a leather manufacturer was selling on Etsy, which is another great platform for all these artists around the world uh, in small numbers or small volume at least. They said, you know what, it's great, we're ramping up, but if we want to build a brand, maybe we need to show our true colors in person. Uh, and they opened a store, and and their brand, their brand grew even more to the point that they're, you know, they're going to do some private labeling because people know and see and feel the quality and can go from there. Uh, but it's a, it is a balance. It depends what your product is, depends what your service is. Are you online? Should you be bricks and mortar? Uh, I, I wish there was a catch-all uh, solution, but... There isn't. That being said, lots of people have done both and see the benefit of both. An interesting company that uh, might be rivaling uh, Lululemon. It's a startup, Canadian startup, called Twiga. This is also profiled in the Financial Post. Uh, a couple years old, and uh, they they are sort of um, getting into an interesting market, uh, personalized clothing, especially personalized athletic wear. I think, and this this guy actually came from Lululemon, so he has some background in there. And he said, you know, he got, kept getting requests because Lululemon came out with a, a children's line a number of years ago and then dropped it. It was kind of a, a, a fad or a passing passing phase for them, but he kept getting requests. So he said, listen, there's got to be a demand out there. That being said, he knew where Lululemon started and he figured, let him start the same way. Let him try and build a brand the same way. So he's out of his basin, basement with five, seven sewing machines, learning how to sew, learning how to put it together and doing customized work that hopefully will grow with time. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com.
Inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and FL Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And this evening, we're chatting with Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting. Uh, Bram and Darren, welcome to CJD. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Josh and Dan, for having us here. Our pleasure. So first question is always the simplest. What do you guys do? Tell us about uh, about your business. So Union Lighting is our third generation lighting company. We do retail and commercial of lighting products. Uh, we are in our 102nd year, which I'm proud to say, and we have been at the same location on Dakari since 1954. Wow. Now you do both com- c- consumer and commercial? Like, Do you touch both sides? Correct. There are two distinct sides of the business. There's a commercial element where we specialize in uh, hospitality, national retail, um, uh, uh, property management, um, as well on the commercial side, there's an architectural hardware component. But then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the largest uh, lighting showroom in Quebec. and uh, certainly it's, a, it's, it's quite the experience just walking through there. No question. Now, this company has been around for, as you said, 102 years since 1914. You guys weren't there at the beginning, but who was it? This is your, your grandfather that so was there? So this is uh, my grandfather and four of his brothers. Um, we took over the business, myself, Darren, and we have another brother, Clifford, who uh, in 1992, we took over the business. We changed the business and became a, we used to be a full line electrical distributor, and now we just specialize in lighting products. So it's strictly lighting, and uh, we profess- we're just professionals in lighting only. Now, were the three of you destined to be in this business? Did you guys work elsewhere? What was your backgrounds, your your schooling? Was it, you know, did you eat and breathe this place on the weekends as you grew up? I think it's safe to say that uh, if we weren't in school, we were uh, working in the business. We were uh, starting at the bottom, sweeping floors and uh, making our way up, learning uh, the ropes. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much in our blood. And uh, a big part of our lives. Every every free weekend or moment, we'd be working part time at the uh, the family business. Did you guys ever have a desire to work elsewhere before coming in this place? Uh, there were there were moments for certain. Uh, you know, I went uh, off to University of Western Ontario and uh, I flirted with a couple of other ideas, um, but sure enough, always pulled back. Uh, you know, drawn like a magnet to what it is that we knew best. Now, there were five brothers originally, you said your grandfather and four brothers, and are narrowed down today. Is it just one component of the family that's left? So, yeah. So, we it started off with one brother who brought over the rest of his brothers uh, from Europe um, in 1914. And then uh, 1932, they changed the name to Union Lighting. Um, and there was five, five families, then down to four families. And since uh, the last four or five years, it's been uh, just our family. So it's uh, one, uh, my father's, we call him the patriarch now. Mm-hmm. Now, when you first took over, I mean, you're, I mean, and Dan, you know, we've seen lots of generations and, and, and lots of kind of weaning and moving through and, and transition stories, um, not necessarily maybe from five family members down to, down to the single one. So that's interesting. When we come back from the break, I think we'll just chat quickly about that transition from maybe your dad to yourselves and, you know, if it was quick or slow uh, before we can move on to lots of other fun things in this 102-year-old story. Another third-generation business here on Today's Entrepreneur, Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting on the program this evening. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, Chartered Professional Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 725, we're joined by, uh, sorry, Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting and Josh, uh, another example of a, a family business uh, from, the, this is the third generation now. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really nice to see that, uh, that we still have some of those uh, establishments lying around Montreal. You know, we, we, we've had some on the air before, Dan. You know, we've had Fraser Furniture. They were around 130 some odd years. Uh, Montreal Window Cleaning at the time was 106. Mm-hmm. Uh, but bo- actually, both those companies are, are have either been sold or moved on to the next stages. So now we're sitting with uh, the longest active uh, company uh, on uh, that we've had on the show. So, and that, you know, we were talking about generations before. And, you know, you had your your dad, your uncles there. But when you guys came into the picture, I think, Bram, you mentioned 1992. Was that a, you came in and there was a slow transition from your dad? Was it quick? Uh, How did that work out? Well, I'd have to say it was was rather fast. It was a fast transition. It was uh, my father kind of passed the reins off and and left. 
Um, I think we all felt pretty comfortable that he was always a phone call away for a question or uh, uh, how do I do this or how do I do that. But we also changed the business around a lot at that time. As I mentioned before, we went from a full line electrical distributor to strictly a lighting distributor, um, which I believe was a very good move on our part and uh, put us in a niche in our industry. Is uh, it, was, it, was there a specific reason you did that? Did you feel that you needed to be more niche instead of more everything to all people? Well, I think because we were, we, we, we no longer had four or five families at the time, and it was only down to two families at that time, it was more controllable. And we were able to build the business with, with, with a smaller assortment of products as opposed to having A to Z products and going up against a lot of multinationals. Now, your three brothers in there, you know, yourself, Bram, and Darren here, and, and Clifford, of course, did you all come in around that same time when your dad left, or was it staggered? I th I, we, we all came in around the same time at, at, at the, 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 the roles that we have today. Um, however, we all worked throughout our schooling careers, and when, like I said, whenever we had a couple free minutes to work at the counter or work at a, or cut the grass or sweep the floors in the basement to make a couple dollars, that's what we did. Do the three brothers overlap? Do you guys have your separate, stra your separate strengths, your separate roles within the company? Oh, absolutely. Um, we we definitely do. Darren is more involved in the retail part of the business. Um, I'm more involved in the commercial as Clifford is. Um, we 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 have our strengths, as you you say. Do you guys have formal meetings? Do you communicate often? Uh, how do you interact between the three of you and and you know your three of you? So does that mean it's easy? There's always a tiebreaker if you guys don't agree. <laughs> There's certainly some structure. I mean, uh, we have um, our. Our managers' meetings, where we all get together and we brainstorm uh, with with um, the staff, and uh, and uh, certainly there's a C level meeting where it's you know primarily just the CFO, our COO, uh, the three partners that and our VP sales, and uh, we'll get together also uh, alternatively. And um, you know, having said that, you know, the, albeit the evolution. Um, you know, has been dynamic, you know, we are surrounded by a very, you know, a core group of players. There's, uh, you know, a lot of our staff has been there for, God, decades. And, um, and, and you know, they do fill in the gaps. I, I would think, point. I would think that being around such a long time, you do have perhaps this great team around you. Is it tough to keep the ideas fresh? Do you every now and then kind of uh, you bring in somebody new to, to make sure that the, 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 I guess the ideas flow or how do you, how do you keep, you know, if I know that, and we've heard that employees, you know, that have been there 30, 40 years, you had the exceptions that are sometimes their brains always thinking, but they also kind of, I don't want to say get stuck, but they're, they're in a certain mode. So do new, new team members, new, new staff kind of help refresh some of the ideas? I'd say that is absolutely correct. Um, also, We'll travel um, extensively to other light fairs and lighting shows, and I mean it is a very dynamic industry. Certainly, in the last many years, with uh, technologies evolving as well, the way they have, and uh, uh, be it from a technological standpoint or from um, more of a, um, a physical, uh, you know, a setup in terms of how we display and whatnot, we learn a lot as we travel, and uh, we definitely like to incorporate that into our uh, business model. And there's no question that technology, uh, certainly when you're around 100 years and the incandescent light bulb has changed a little bit, uh, that certainly affects your business. So when we come back uh, after the news break, we'll explore that a little bit further. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, Chartered Professional Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.36 on today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. Dan Delmar and F.L. Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And Josh, this evening we're chatting with Bram and Darren, namer of Union Lighting and uh, Decor. And uh, you've probably seen the uh, the store on Decarry, lots of different lights there. Uh, guys, how, do you know how many lights you have illuminated in your showroom there? Because I, I can only imagine what your hydro bill must be like. Thousands. Thousands. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's, Just it's, like it's, the hydro bill. Thousands. <laughs> thousands. <laughs> I mean, the showroom itself is uh, just about 40,000 square feet now, and it is packed. Wow. Now, there, there's no doubt, but just before the uh, the news break, we were talking about briefly touching on technology uh, and the fact that, you know, in 102 years, the technology has changed a little bit, although probably most in the last several years versus maybe the first 90. Uh, how 
tell, talk to us about your business and technology and how that's kind of affected you. Well, technology has changed our industry tremendously over the last four, five, six, even 10 years. Um, it's very difficult for us to keep our staff educated and up to, up to speed on all the, new, all the new product that comes out. So what we do is once a week, we usually have a lunch and learn with the manufacturer who would come in and bring a lunch and we would sit down and they would explain all the new technology, why this one is this color and why this will save us money and wattage and so on and so forth. But it's an ever-ending industry and the technology, we, you need to be on top of that. And that's why we, we, we are the specialists in lighting in Montreal. Now, how do you stay ahead of the curve? I mean, do you rely on your suppliers to educate you? Do you, I mean, do you go to trade shows? Do you, when you travel for your, uh, you know, around the world, what you see what's, what's coming next? I'd say all of the above. Certainly, we do depend on our suppliers. The trade shows are very important. Um, uh, you know, electricians tend to, you know, look towards us to, you know, help them out with uh, their needs, as do the designers. So it's it's very important that we stay on top of it. Now, when you're buying product, you're, I mean, you're not manufacturing or making here. Where do you buy from primarily? Um, we buy from primarily out of uh, North America. Having said that, a lot of the technology comes from all over the world, but the industry is set up such that uh, you have uh, manufacturers, reps, and agents that are typically uh, localized, and, uh, and, and they come visit. Uh, boy, do they ever come visit. <laughs> they uh, knock on your door cons- you know, constantly, and uh, we're very open to learning and, and sharing that information. Do you buy from China as well? Is there a lot of low-cost product that is competing, or have you not decided not to be in that space? We, we decided not to be in that space. We don't want to compete with the, the box stores. We like to have product that no one else has. Um, and, and just to go back to your question, there's we have many, many manufacturers, and there's many different manufacturers for the commercial side of the business as to the retail side of the business. But uh, to go back to China, no, we're not. Uh, we mostly buy from North American manufacturers. Now, are you buying in U.S. dollars? The in the the some of the U.S. manufacturers more mostly in the retail side is in U.S. dollars. The commercial is in Canadian dollars. Now, how how do, how have you dealt with this rise in the U.S. dollar versus the Canadian? Well, it's 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 very difficult. Um, the we the cost factor, the landed cost factor to us is very difficult. Um, we have opened a store, we um, a commercial side of our business in the United States, so we are receiving U.S. dollars, so it helps us with the FX factor. Um, however, the, 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 the lucky part of our, of the exchange is that it's only for our retail side. It's not our full business that we're buying in us dollars. That's good. Now let's switch gears a little bit to marketing, uh, a little bit, your location. Uh, I, I know that you're, you're trying to create, uh, or you've created a real destination that is called, and I'll, I'll let Darren say it because he's been practicing and he wants to say it. He has to hit his quota to say this exact term. Go ahead, Darren. It is, uh. It is uh, Montreal's design center, Carré Union, and uh, it is very design centric. It's uh, loaded with about uh, 17 uh, tenants that um, are all um, in the uh, world of decor. So, be it uh, windows, uh, patio furniture, granite, uh, carpeting, flooring, uh, lighting, kitchens, uh, electroménager. There's, there's. Now, what was the evolution? I mean, this wasn't always, you, you weren't creating this full destination for a long time. It was just, you know, come to Union Lighting. But at what point did you guys realize that, you know what, maybe we need to attract more. Maybe the the consumer needs a better reason to come to this area as opposed to just us. Well, we felt that um, bricks bricks and mortar are still very important in this world and, and especially in our industry. And if we could bring have a reason for a, a someone renovating their home to come to a one-stop shop where they could go and buy a fridge and a kitchen and a carpet and flooring and, and granite, then we're just facilitating their, their, their choices. Um, we, we, we really believe in the product. Now, all these other, I guess, tenants that are in the building, these complementary products, is there, I guess, there, there's a gentleman's agreement. You guys try to refer each other. Uh, how, how, is there anything formal? It's really informal. Well, it's, re- it's really informal. We're, we're all friendly, and we all want everyone to succeed. And, and we actually, believe it or not, have a waiting list to move into our building. We have tenants that have been there for 20 years. Um, we we uh, are very supportive of each other, and we always push, push uh, customers to our 
neighbors. Now it's funny you mentioned the you're a you're more of a bricks and mortar business. Talk to me about online and how maybe social media, your website, how that you feel might help your business, help sales, and where you're at in your stage of of, of being online. I'd say that um, social media is very important uh, to us because people that are involved in uh, renovating or sourcing uh, the finest product in the world typically go to uh, the internet for information. Um, Having said that, um, and we're about to launch uh, a new website, um, a transactional website, I'd still say that um, the focus, we're still trying to uh, have it um, as a push to store. We want people to, you know, come to store. So we believe that there will be transactions, but again, there's an emphasis on push to store. Interesting, you're you're saying as you're you're building that e-commerce, that transactional website, when did you first start that? Like, uh, I know we've heard a lot of stories and, you know, some nightmare stories and horror stories and some people take a short period of time, but others that take forever. How long has the process been? Uh, for you to, to deal with this far too long for us <laughs> in a, in a, a as, as many entrepreneurs will agree with you I'm sure yeah but you know there's a part of me that uh, doesn't really mind because there has been such an evolution even on that front and so I'd say that our first generation uh, site and even second would not even be what it is that we're planning to launch uh, shortly so not too bothered by it we've always had uh, you know a focus on the store as well so so what, what marketing has worked for you? Is it more just word of mouth? Is it just because you've been in the same location for so many years? That's, what, what, do you, what do you find works the best for you? That's a big part of it, but it's always been a, kind of a mixed medium approach. So there, there's been a traditional media, um, be it a magazine um, or a flyer program that was more a call to action. And then certainly now more of late, uh, it's it's the social media side and uh, that focus, that push to get the uh, the website launched. And what about associations or buying groups or trade shows? Have, have any of those worked for you? Well, trade shows work. Absolutely, they work and they're very important to us. We um, just joined a buying group, actually, um, which we have. It's, it's mostly the same manufacturers that we dealt with before, but they give you different terms. And, and because of the FX problems in, in the retail part of the business, it's facilitated. Um, the, the buying, it gives you extra terms and so on and so forth. So, uh, yes. Today's entrepreneur on CJAD 800, Bram and Darren Namer with us this evening of Union Lighting. We'll have their one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur on the way. And coming up next, Nick Moraitis, tax partner at Fuller Landau, uh, tackles uh, the two budgets, both provincially and federally, and how it can impact your business. That's next. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult FL Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar and FL Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And this evening, we're welcoming uh, Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting uh, to the studio. And we have Nick Moraitis as well, tax partner at Fuller Landau. And uh, Nick is here to talk about the recent budgets, both both uh, provincially and federally. Nick, welcome back. Hi there. Um, uh, let's start perhaps with, with some major highlights. Um, do you want to start provincially or federally? Oh, it's a l- little bit of a both, actually. Um one thing that uh, came under the um, the eye of both governments is uh, the small business deduction, which, which we've heard about. Uh, corporations that are controlled by Canadians uh, get a special uh, break um, on the first half a million dollars of profit that their company earns. Um, and Quebec last year started the uh, challenge, and this year they modified it and basically uh, tied the getting of the deduction to creating jobs. So if your business uh, doesn't have, um, that last year they said, if it doesn't have uh, more than uh, three full-time employees, we won't give you the small business deduction, which means rather than paying 8% on your Quebec taxes, you're paying closer to 12 uh, This year they modified it a bit to factor in seasonal and part-time employment. So they said you have to have at least 5,500 working hours in your company to be able to get the small business deduction. If you don't, uh, then you, you don't get it. Now, that hits a lot of uh, small businesses. Uh, it was, uh, many believe, targeted to the professionals, uh, the uh, accountants, the lawyers, the doctors who incorporate over the last decade or so. But it can also hit um, uh, someone as simple as a real estate broker who, uh, who who's out there, uh, anybody who doesn't have a lot of employees or doesn't need them. Uh, so that was the Quebec challenge, uh, and that this new rule kicks in next year in 2017. Um, with the federal, they also looked at it as well, and they said, well, we're going to approach it a different way. 
Um, it doesn't bother them that a professional is incorporated if he's servicing clients. And they're saying, well, that's a business, and business is a business, so you're getting your small business deduction. What they didn't like uh, were a lot of uh, um, incorporated, uh, especially the, this is really the professionals, uh, work through uh, larger entities and organizations. So a doctor might be uh, an owner of a clinic along with a whole bunch of other doctors, but he will bill his services to the clinic who will bill them out to you, or actually they're going to the RAMQ. Um, a lawyer will be billing a professional partnership, and that professional partnership bills the client. And they basically identified a whole situ- a bunch of situations where that incorporated lawyer or professional will not get the uh, small business deduction because he's billing an intermediary who's billing the end client. And now a complete relook of, uh, of the small business deduction. That's been a major, uh, major item affecting a lot of s- small businesses. Now, with, with all these... I guess changes to small businesses and small business deduction. Are, are there really? Is there anything entrepreneurs can do, or this is the kind of the law as it is? And if you if you want it, well, then grow your business, start hiring people, and uh, well, it's, and get it, it going. Quebec is harsh because you either need the employees or you don't. Uh, and and uh, if you don't, then they're they're basically saying then we don't want to give you that tax break. Uh, the, the federal government um, is coming after something that they themselves have approved over the last decade and a half. So it's been a change in their thought process. So don't, right now we don't see uh, uh, ways to get around it. I, I know it's brand new, but is there any guidelines on this 5,500? Like, you know, they, they were trying to hit three full-time people, but what if one person really busts his rear end and works 50 No, there, there's hours. a cap of 40 hours a week. So basically, really? yeah. Uh, so once you, you can be working 60 hours a week. We're only counting the first 40. And as we all know, entrepreneurs and people in business are working far more yeah, than 40 no, that, hours a week. That, that doesn't so go. They've, they've just killed it. Well, when we come back from the break, we'll, we'll chat a little bit more about some of these special items that entrepreneurs are, 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 in, are in for with these changes in, with the budget. Plus, Bram and Darren Namers, one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur that's next. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult F.L. Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Bram and Darren Namer of Union Lighting share their one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur on the way. But first, Nick Radis with us, tax partner at FL, uh, talking about the recent budgets and their impact on business. And Nick, I know there's uh, there's probably a number of things to talk about, but there's one very important one that deals with the potential sale of your business. Maybe you can touch upon that. Um, the, the federal government changed, and we're assuming that Quebec is going to go along with it to uh, what we call goodwill and other intangibles such as customer lists, uh, the name of the business, etc. Um, prior to next year, actually, so it's still available in 2016, if a business sells its goodwill, and, and many times, Josh, when we were doing these transactions, uh, uh, the buyer wants the assets of the business. Yeah, you're give not me ta- your client you're, lists, give me your name, give me your web page, give me that, and you can keep your company. I, I want the, the thing that generates the income. Um, and what Goodwill ends up doing here in Canada is you're essentially paying uh, a 13.5% tax rate here in Quebec on your Goodwill that you sell. And uh, half of the Goodwill that you end up selling, you can eventually take out as a tax rate dividend to the shareholders. Um, and that's a pretty interesting regime. Uh, and it's not something that we do. We, 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 even though we may have structured the business with trusts, etc., to get the capital gains exemption, if you're forced into a situation that you're selling the assets, it's not a bad deal. But, and, but they changed that. Yeah, they changed that. In 2017, basically, what they do is rather you're now moving up to around 27% immediate tax rate um, because they realize that there's this deferral and people were actually happy to sell their, their goodwill. They've now changed it. They made it, um, they made some of the things they made easier for depreciation, et cetera. But in the terms of selling your business starting in 2017, they've just doubled your tax rate uh, uh, immediately. So there's no more deferral. There therefore means there's a planning opportunity. And, and if there is businesses who are uh, out there that might be uh, getting sold, et cetera, know that after December 31st, 2016, the game changes. And you may want to look at planning opportunities before then. And maybe crystallizing that game That's earlier right. on. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I'm sure there's lots more to talk about. There's that, lots, but, lots more, but, but you won't uh, let me Another talk. time. We won't let you talk. Uh, but as we approach the last moments of the show, we'll turn to Bram and Darren Namer and ask you guys, what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? Boy, one. That'd be tough to, you know, distill it down to one. Um, having said that, I suppose I would, uh, there are two things actually that come to mind. Um, the first one, I guess I'll fall back on a simple quote um, from uh, Winston Churchill, and that is uh, KBO, keep buggering on, 
because it is not going to be easy, but you definitely have to uh, push yourself to rise to the equation, uh, occasion and uh, never, never give up. And I suppose the other thing would be um, if uh, you're going to surround yourself with people, um, you should probably uh, listen to them and take their advice. Excellent. Thanks very much, Darren. And Bram? Well, I I agree with the, the number two. I agree with number one also. Hmm. But number two is I think it's very important to listen to your employees. Listen to the people that are on the front lines, and they often have very good advice. And uh, my number two would be to sur- don't be afraid to hire people that are smarter than you. Surround yourself with good people. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, so much to take away uh, in uh, 102 years of business. But uh, the fact that they dealt with transition in such an easy manner and that their their father before them was was very helpful, I think, is, uh, is uh, hopefully many people can live through that type of, of transition. Thanks to Brian and Darren Namer of Union Lighting and Nick Moraitis, tax partner at FL. Back next Monday night at 7 p.m. here for today's Entrepreneur on CJAD 800. The Exchange with Beryl Wiseman is next. <laughs>